<laughs> How about this? Yeah. He's a beaut, eh? My name is Gareth Cliff and you're watching Joburg Today. Hello and welcome to Joburg Today. My name is Dumi Tlapo bringing you the best of what's going down in and around Johannesburg. Exploring the cradle of humankind has been quite scientific and limited to those able to get down into the caves with some of the most exciting discoveries and findings that have been made in recent years. But that is not the only way to experience it. And here is Bill Harrop to tell us more. Well, I've been in the business since before Pontius was a pilot and the Dead Sea hadn't even reported sick. And that, I think, is about the time probably 30 odd thousand years ago, when these homeless the lady and his offspring and his relatives lived in this particular area. It fascinates me, absolutely fascinates me. We explain that they could have lived in this whole area. We're on the northern stretches. But when you look over that area, the landscape hasn't changed much in terms of the rocks and the mountains and the formations. Maybe the vegetation's changed, maybe it's less forestation than the, the, they used to be down south, but it's, it hasn't changed a great deal. And these mountains, we, this is what we tell people as well, these are the Mahalisbergs. Now if you read the South African book, they will tell you that they're the oldest mountains in the world. But if you read the South American book, they're the second oldest mountains in the world. <laughs> it's great to share that sense of place and the feeling that you get w with other people. We're all so enthusiastic about what we do and we're sharing it with other people. And then at the end of the flight, when people say, oh, thank you for, thank you so much, thank you very much. And we sometimes say, well, thank you for paying for us to have fun. And of course, then we're gonna come back for breakfast and have some of my most famous Northumbrian porridge, which is another story. That's only six or 700 years old. I came to this country from Bermuda. And ever since I was a 14 year old, I was always interested in sailing. And as I became, uh, more fortunate, I managed to have a beautiful sailboat, a 45-foot ocean-going sailboat and a water ski boat. And living in Bermuda, people said, but it's a golfing nation, why are you sailing? And I said, well, the girls wear much more interesting clothes when they're sailing. But I loved sailing, I really loved sailing. And then I came to this country, I'm as far away from the sea as Bermuda is from dry land, so I looked for another hobby. And a hot air balloon flew over in 1976. It flew over my house in Randburg in those days. I ran out, I said, where do I learn to do this? And this guy, Terry Adams, he was number five in the world at the time. He taught me, and most of the old pilots in South Africa he taught. And I took it up as a hobby, one that I couldn't really afford. And I thought, well, maybe if I charge people, uh, they can pay for it. And, and, and then I'll have free flying. And then I was approached on the 1st of April, 1981, by DCA, as it was then, he said, Arthur Thomas here, he said, you're running an airline and hire and reward and you're not licensed. And I said, if it wasn't April Fool's Day, <laughs> I, I, after midday, and I said, okay, fine, what do I do? How high do I have to jump? You know, if they want you to jump, jump as high as you can and do your best to cooperate. And we did, and we applied for an airline license, so I'm an airline owner. We're a fully licensed, non-scheduled airline ever since 1981. And that means for the public's point of view, the passenger's point of view, means that we do things right. We're properly insured, we're properly maintained, properly licensed aircraft. Our pilots go on the courses, regular updates every six months. I check them. Every year they do a crew resource management course. And it's brought the standard up of ballooning throughout the country. When we started, we called the company Balloon Safari South Africa, what we did and where we did it. And then other people, seeing you get, you think you're getting rich, you know, <laughs> but they see you doing it and they say, oh yeah, we do ballooning in South Africa. So I had to change the name because the travel agents from overseas were getting a bit confused. So then we thought, well, let's do the, it's an Edwardian sort of theme, isn't it? So let's do the old Edwardian. If that ain't the original, you shouldn't be doing it. So we put up Bill Harrop's original balloon safaris. And of course that name is stuck. It's been a bit of a joke and it makes people ask, why do you say you're uh, the original? And so I can explain it. Hi, I'm Louis Mkise and you're watching Joburg Today. 
Like us on Facebook, JoeBigToday.tv, and follow us on Twitter at JoeBigToday. According to Lee Berger, the work that him and his team have done over the past three years has resulted in more individual ancient human relative remains than were discovered in the entire history of the search for human origins on the continent of Africa. Firstly, I would like to welcome all of you to Marupim World Heritage Site. Welcome back home. Uh, this is your home, this is our home. We, as humanity, uh, call this place our home in, in Africa, in, in South Africa. Today we gather here at this rich site of pilgrimage for paleoscientific inquiry and world-class research, which seeks to help us to understand our ancestry and the origins of humanity much better than we have ever done before. This skeleton is, is, is quite be more complete uh, than the famous Lucy skeleton. It's actually got a skull. And it's actually got the missing face of Homo naledi, something that we didn't have from the Dinaledi chamber, those very, very fragile bones. And so it now can act as our sort of Rosetta Stone. The, the thing that we can compare all of those bits and pieces to, so that we can now understand what the proportions of Naledi were, we can understand perhaps uh, the, the sort of massiveness of males versus females. It's a male, and we named him Neo, which means the gift, not after the, the guy in the matrix. The entirety of the anatomy of Homo Naledi from the Lissetti chamber compared to the Lissetti chamber is identical, which in itself is really, really surprising, except we got the nose wrong. We didn't have those very fragile bones of the nose before, and so we kind of had to estimate from what we saw of the skull morphology. And like a lot of people, we thought that the frontal area of, of Naledi was going to be a little bit more advanced, maybe something a little closer to Homo erectus. We now have the face with Neo's face, and we know that's not true. It's actually quite primitive, and it actually looks more like the faces of things like Homo habilis and very primitive members of the genus Homo. So one part of the anatomy that we didn't have, we're guessing at. The rest of it, though, has held in the hypothesis stand. What we have is, for the last million years, scientists and archaeologists, paleoanthropologists, working in Africa have largely worked under the idea that only one species existed at any one time. Once you had large brain humans and our immediate ancestors like Archaic Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, effectively they wiped all the competition out each time a new species would appear. So it was one game. We now know that's not true. We've just discovered a hominid that existed alongside that's actually primitive and survived well into the time where all of that was going on. Did they interbreed with Homo sapiens? We don't have evidence for that yet. We'll try. We're trying to get ancient DNA. The tests have failed so far, but don't give up on that yet because they're within the time window that we're beginning to push ancient DNA back to. If we find that DNA, we'll know the answer to the question, did Homo naledi interbreed with Homo sapiens? I think that this, uh, these discoveries, because they're actually two major discoveries that we're announcing, uh, rank at least equal to the announcement of Homo naledi. I mean, we're telling the world that not only have we found a second chamber with one of the most complete hominid skeletons in it that's ever been discovered, but we now know the age of Homo naledi, and it is strikingly young, far younger than any scientist had uh, guessed. The idea that Homo naledi deliberately disposed of its dead in the Dinaledi chamber was a hypothesis based on the elimination of other possibilities. Of course, it was only a single occurrence. Now, we have a second occurrence. We have a second occurrence in another chamber over 100 meters away that is almost identical to the first. It's got Homo naledi in it. They show no signs of scavenging damage, carnivore kills, and other things. So I think, on a personal basis, that adds substantive weight to the idea that Homo naledi was using the rising star cave system in a very interesting way that may have mirrored the kind of behaviors we see in modern humans who deliberately dispose of their dead and go to great lengths to do it. So we use six independent dating techniques to find out the age of Homo naledi. Homo naledi in the Dinaledi chamber, that's the chamber we announced back in 2015, 
are between 236 and 335,000 years ago. Now that sounds like a long time ago, but it's nothing like what scientists thought Homo naledi would be. They thought Homo naledi would be millions of years old. Based on its anatomy and its morphology, it was thought to be at least a million, but probably more likely two or even two and a half million years old. Well, that may be when the species originated, but it survived all the way down to deposit its dead in this little chamber just yesterday, effectively in archaeological terms. What's important about that date as well is that that coincides when, with when we thought the rise of modern human behavior was occurring in Southern Africa. So we're left with kind of two possibilities. Either Homo naledi is the one doing that, or they may have interacted with our immediate direct ancestors. Either of those are really exciting possibilities. Well, I think it's going to have profound effects on the science of archaeology. Uh, now archaeologists have to look at the archaeological record of Africa and be very careful about their interpretations because they now know there at any one time are at least two different candidate species that might be making them. You can't assume it's just, for example, modern humans or Homo erectus. There, there's another candidate out there. That's going to make archaeology very complex for a while. It's going to mean that we have to have extraordinary discoveries to make extraordinary claims about behavior. That's a big deal. The whole archaeological record has to be looked at. It also means we're no longer going to be able to use morphology to date a fossil. We actually have to find those fossils in situ because Homo naledi could have existed for millions of years. And if you'd found it at any one time, you would have, as many scientists did, make the wrong assumption about how old it was. It's not this population wasn't millions of years, but lived into the relatively recent past. From a first person perspective, it's pitch dark. If you turn your light off, you are in complete darkness. You've been in darkness on the torturous journey to get there for about 70 meters. So it's truly, truly black. Once your lights are on, you find yourself in a sort of narrow passageway that's maybe two meters wide at some points, but narrows off into these little alcoves. It's the alcoves on the side that we're finding these bodies of Homo naledi in there. Um, Neo, the skeleton, the partial skeleton we found, he sits back in a tight corner that you have to worm your way into and excavate very carefully. The, one of the babies sits up in a, another corner about uh, 10 or 15 meters away from that position. Another adult is found in another position as if they were around the edges. Now we think the reason they're like that is because we think the center actually washed away sometime in the distant past. It, it's amazing. It is, I guess, the only human term I could use, like work, working in a tomb. But in fact, it's not a human tomb if it is one. Hi, I'm Sophie Ndaba, and you are watching Joburg Today. That's all for today. For more on the city, do check out our playlist. From myself, Dimitlapo, and the Joburg Today crew, it's goodbye.